there certainly can be some risk factors that we would see in patients for grade three, four toxicities, but not what you would think. Um, you certainly could have a patient who has some renal dysfunction and they may develop more toxicities when they're given capecitabine. That's why we need to evaluate those patients ahead of treatment to see what their organ function is. But I think the thing that's really frightening about some of the toxicities that we're seeing, early onset toxicity with these drugs as well as what we see in an overdose case is, is that you're not really guaranteed what's gonna happen to that patient. So a patient that you could think will have no trouble at all can become very, very ill very, very quickly. Um, you know, patient where you say, oh, you're gonna be completely fine, these are really well tolerated drugs, and they end up in the hospital unable to eat and drink because they've got severe mucositis. Those are situations where I think we as providers have to realize that this is not a benign set of drugs that no one's gonna have a reaction to. This is something that does happen to people, and we have to really stop and listen and evaluate and treat people with antidotes when it's appropriate. The triggers for ur urgent interventions for a patient who's receiving 5-FU or capecitabine, whether it's a in situation where they have had an overdose, where it's a situation where they've had an early onset toxicity, is having a low threshold for treatment. We don't want to have a patient wait. We don't want to take a wait and see approach because you certainly could be missing the opportunity. In terms of being able to administer an antidote such as Vistagard, you have a window of opportunity. The drug needs to be given within 96 hours of when the patient has completed their um, treatment or when, or when you've identified their overdose or when you've discontinued their treatment because of toxicity. Um, there is efficacy that will drop off dramatically if you're missing that window. And it's also a matter of not waiting to see whether or not the patient has some sort of um, a metabolic issue. We have in the past said, oh, we're gonna wait and get DPD testing. Well, the problem with DPD testing is, is that it misses a very significant um, number of people who actually have some sort of a metabolic processing issue. We can send testing out and you don't know, are you gonna miss your 96 hour window because you're waiting on the testing? And then you've missed your opportunity to treat the patient. Um, there is a large number of people who are not going to have a result that shows up as their DPD deficient, and yet you are seeing every single sign and symptom that they've got severe side effects, severe toxicity. The recognition of serious or life-threatening toxicities from 5-FU or capecitabine uh, can be broken down into the common toxicities, but you know more severe and often earlier onset. So for example, uh, starting from the top down, uh, stomatitis or mucositis is not uncommon, but within uh, grading criteria, you know, grade three, four is someone who has uh, involvement of their, uh, the majority of the muc mucosal surfaces of the mouth, people who have pain and difficulty swallowing, uh, that is refractory to standard supportive measurements like oral rinses um, and oral uh, antifungal agents. Um, people who have oral bleeding uh, from significant mucosal involvement. Uh, these are all consistent with significantly above or outside of the normal toxicities that would be expected. Uh, the same level of mucositis uh, can actually be extended through the whole GI tract uh, from mouth to anus. And so patients who present with uh, refractory diarrhea, more than five to eight bowel movements per day, which are watery, often associated with some bleeding. Uh, patients who are unable to maintain adequate hydration by mouth and require intravenous hydration or hospital admission. Uh, these are, or that's an early or severe uh, warning sign. Uh, early cytopenias, uh, which, so cytopenias are relatively uncommon with cape cytopene. The, the rates of neutropenia and febrile neutropenia are relatively low. So patients who are on cape cytopene who develop um, early drop in their blood counts, like a white blood cell count going from four to 0 0.1 uh, in a matter of a short period of time and that patient developing fever would be considered uh, severe and potentially life-threatening. Similarly, uh, with intravenous 5-FU, patients who discontinue drug after their infusion completes uh, and call two days later with fever uh, and easy bruising, bleeding, uh, or mucosal irritation, that, that would be a severe warning sign. Uh, the refractory nausea vomiting is another GI toxicity that can be considered uh, severe or life-threatening. Uh, when we think about refractory nausea or vomiting, you know, grade three, four events, these are people who are 
unable to take in any food. Uh, people who require IV antiemetics, they're not responsive to oral anti-nausea drugs. Uh, they require intravenous nutritional support or fluid. Uh, and then probably the most concerning are the neurotoxicities and the cardiac toxicities. So neurotoxicity is not an expected side effect from either capecitabine or infusional 5-FU. So if a patient or family member reports um, confusion, uh, altered thinking, um, uh, or neurologic deficits, uh, seizures, can, the whole gamut, uh, any of those events would be considered severe and warrant immediate intervention. Similarly, cardiac toxicity is not an expected event. Although it's well described, it's not an expected event from normal dosing of 5-FU or capecitabine. So people who present with uh, cardiac sounding chest pain, so central chest pain radiating to the left arm, people who present with uh, symptomatic palpitations and are diagnosed with an arrhythmia on electrocardiogram. Um, those are all things that are not expected and warrant um, immediate intervention. Um, in terms of more severe toxicities, grade 3, 4, I can also talk with you about a case that we had several months ago. It was really before we had awareness of the need to administer an antidote such as Vistagard. A patient who came in, um, got a treatment, the, phone, the family called in the following day. The daughter reported that um, her mother was confused, brought her into the emergency room. Patient was indeed confused. Um, she also had cardiac toxicity. So when she had a cardiac evaluation done, she had dropped her ejection fraction to 25%. That is certainly not something that we would normally expect to see with 5-FU, but it's an established toxicity. Um, the patient also had renal failure whether that was as a result of her 5-FU or from her oxaloplatin or combination of both, it was there. The patient ended up being admitted to the hospital. She developed some cytopenias, had to be transfused. So we had a patient who within, again, she had started treatment one day, came into the emergency room the following day with an extremely short period of time. Again, not a situation of overdose. This was early onset toxicity had cardiac toxicity, had um, neurotoxicity, and ended up with renal dysfunction. We see a range of toxicities with capecitabine and 5-FU, both early onset and as a result of overdose. I think if you think about the common side effects of 5-FU and capecitabine, one of the things we always talk to people about is diarrhea. And certainly nausea and vomiting could be experienced, although not as common. So if you have a patient that is calling the office and saying, you know, I'm having so much diarrhea that I can't control my bowels. Um, I'm not really able to eat and drink because I'm having severe nausea. And we would say, you know, hey, why don't you come in? We'll see how you're doing. We will draw some lab work on them and they could have some abnormalities because they've become dehydrated. But then also your index of suspicion stops because they start to drop their blood counts. And although people can certainly have cytopenias as a result of any chemotherapy, we certainly don't see them to a very significant extent in many patients who are getting capecitabine or 5-fluorouracil, and we certainly don't expect to see them within a couple of days of when people have either you know, completed um, or have had therapy interrupted. So that raises your index of suspicion that this is a patient who clearly could be experiencing early onset toxicity. Um, they could end up being admitted to the hospital because their blood counts have dropped such that they're gonna end up being septic um, requiring transfusion support, support, requiring antibiotics, um, hopefully not requiring admission to the ICU. The cardiac toxicities of uh, 5-FU and oral 5-FU um, are uncommon and sometimes not immediately recognized by physicians. Uh, and this is really uh, because of the rarity, so it's not something that the average oncologist is going to see maybe more than once or twice during a career. And this really comes back to education of all of the office staff, as well as some of the patient educational materials that are given for uh, patients being prescribed 5-FU. So uh, like many uh, clinical practices, uh, we have um, informational sheets about 5-FU and capecitabine when patients are given these drugs. And, and on those sheets, uh, you know, cardiac toxicity is a listed potential complication. Uh, and so certainly physicians as well as patients need to refresh themselves about these things periodically. So reading the information that you're giving the patients helps remind clinicians and office staff across the board that cardiac toxicity is a well-described 
chemo-associated event, uh, particularly with uh, 5-FU and somewhat less so with oral 5-FU or capecitabine. Uh, but it can still go under-recognized by clinicians, and so any cardiac-sounding symptom, whether it's chest pain, shortness of breath, or palpitations, uh, needs to be worked up, and clinicians need to think about whether or not this may be attributable to the chemotherapy agent that they're prescribing. And certainly uh, office staff, nursing, pharmacy, uh, you know, represent a, an, another level of checks and balances uh, to remind us that this may be a chemotherapy-related side effect. The physicians and nurses' ability to connect cardiac toxicity to the use of capecitabine and 5-FU um, is an area where we still need a lot of education and eye-opening, if you will. Um, I've worked in oncology for a very long time. I've worked as an infusion nurse. Over the course of my practice, I have seen the occasion where you give someone some 5-FU and all of a sudden they're experiencing chest pain. And everybody panics and you obviously treat the patient appropriately. You're not just going to pass it off and you know you get out the resources and you say, oh yeah, there's an incidence of coronary artery spasm. We think that's what that is. We tell the patient and the family, you'll be fine, you know, we're going to get you checked out, but this is something that happens very rarely. There's a larger spectrum of things that happen. Um, patients can have a myocardial infarction. They can have a decrease in their ventricular ejection fraction. They can have arrhythmias. Um, there are, unfortunately, cases of cardiac arrest and death. And so we don't see these commonly. I think it is something that people have to realize is a possible side effect. And we just can't sort of say, oh, there's such a low incidence of that, I'm not really gonna worry about it or sort of keep it in my thinking. Um, these things do happen. We had a patient who ended up in the hospital a day after she had started a 5-FU infusion, otherwise um, healthy woman, and her ejection fraction was evaluated and found to be 25%. She ended up recovering, and uh, she you know, was able to move on with her life, was not able to continue with treatment, but it was a very serious side effect that took a couple of months before her heart returned to a normal function. In terms of central nervous system toxicities with capecitabine and 5-FU, I think the thing that really people have to be aware of is, is that people should not be at the point where they are so fatigued that they can't get out of bed. They should not be at the point where they're having confusion. We shouldn't be getting a phone call from a, a family member that you know mom or dad is having confusion and they're very worried about them. I think it's a matter also of patient education um, some people will read the bottles of anti-nausea medicines that they're given to take home, and you know the label may say may, may cause drowsiness. We have to educate people that a neurotoxicity could be not not that you're a little bit sleepy and you may take a nap because you've taken an anti-nausea pill, but you know someone who is difficult to wake up. Um, you know people who say, hey, I went to bed at four o'clock yesterday afternoon because I wasn't feeling well, and at ten o'clock the following morning I could barely wake myself up. Those are really serious concerns for neurotoxicity. We commonly see skin toxicities with both 5-FU and capecitabine. I think one of the things that we differentiate, certainly in patients with capecitabine, is the degree of hand-foot syndrome. We tell patients that they may have some redness, some cracking, some drying of the skin on the hands and the feet. Um, those will certainly progress the longer patients have been on therapy. But we worry about the patient with early skin toxicity. So if a patient calls you and says, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on, but I have a red rash. Um, my skin looks like I'm sunburnt all over. Those are things that are not normal in patients who are especially starting out with, their, with these treatments, and that would be an index of suspicion that they're starting to experience a dermal toxicity. Um, for patients who are not metabolizing these drugs or have had an overdose, they can rapidly progress from a situation where they've got a little bit of a red rash um, to a very quick scenario where they're experiencing significant um, cracking, peeling, sloughing of their skin and may require hospitalization because, you know, skin is your defense against infection and their skin is starting to break down and you've got to bring them in and hospitalize them to, to protect them from serious side effects.